for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Once again, good morning, Calvary. Hey, grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 is where we'll be today. And uh, do, you ever, do you ever have those moments where you, you hear a song and you're like, ooh, I like that song. Like it just kind of catches your attention, or maybe it's like your song, it's one of your favorites. And you're like, ooh, 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 I hear that, and I want to I listen to it, and you kind of turn your ear towards it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or maybe the news is on. And you're just, you're not paying attention. You don't care about anything that's being said in the national news until they say Toledo, Ohio. And then all of a sudden you lean in because you're like, oh, that's something from where I live, right? I believe that God's word is always timeless, but I also believe that many messages are timely. Like they're just what someone needs in just the moment when they need it. And I believe that that's something that God is at work doing through this message today. Can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? And in the same way that a song might catch your attention or the news might catch your attention, some of you, it's, it's a good moment for you to kind of lean your ear into what the Spirit might want to say today. Before we pray, and just to, to give you a moment, just kind of think about this, I'd be curious, if you're here today and you would say, God, I feel like I'm in the middle of something that I do not understand. And, and you, you, you can decide what that is. But you would just say, right now, in my life, I'm in the middle of something. God, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't see it. it. It just doesn't make sense. If you're in the middle of something you do not understand, can you just raise your hand right where you're at today and just say, God, I'm listening. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I know that your word is timeless and it's timely. And that today you have something you want to speak to some of our hearts. So would you use your word today to encourage us, to strengthen us, to challenge us, and ultimately, before we're done here today, Lord, would you use your word in a very real way to give us hope? And we ask this in Jesus' name. And together the church said, amen, amen. amen. Well, hey, today is going to be a little bit different. A lot of times, you know, what we, we walk through is a presentation of God's word, kind of at a classic kind of sermon style. I think today might, for some of us, even feel a little bit more like a Bible study. I want to I teach you a concept, kind of a theological idea. We'll get back to looking more uh, specifically at the Pharisees next week in, in Matthew chapter 12. And I know as soon as I said the words, we're going to look at a theological idea, some of you went, I wonder what's on Instagram. <laughs> like You're like, but stick with me, all right? Hang with me today. I want to show you something. We're going to talk about something that scholars, that theologians will often refer to as the messianic secret. They call it the messianic secret. If, if you remember where we were last week, Matthew chapter 12, and we had gotten to the point where the Pharisees said, let's make plans and try to kill Jesus. Does anybody remember that? Right? No. Okay, so last week, <laughs> we ended when the Pharisees said, let's make plans and try to kill Jesus. Here's what happens next. Matthew chapter 12, verse 15. Aware of this... Jesus withdrew from that place, and a large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. Have you ever read a passage like that in the Gospels? And you go, huh? Jesus, you, you need somebody to help you with marketing. Like You, you need some branding things, because some of the stuff you're doing is really good, Jesus. Like You've got people coming out and you're healing them, and it's amazing, but aren't you here so the world will know? Like, like the Bible even says, Jesus, that you came because God so loved the world that you came to give us life, but if you keep telling people not to talk about you, that's not, are you using the social media right, Jesus? Have, have, you, have you looked into how your web page is being optimized? Because Jesus, when you tell people not to tell others about you, it seems a little counterproductive. Have you ever seen those things in scripture? That's what we refer to as the messianic secret. There's this theme. You see it in one way or another in all four gospels where there are times where Jesus says to people, don't, don't tell anybody. Don't share this story. Don't tell them who I am. 
It's actually a major theme in the Gospel of Mark, and there's five times that you see it in the Gospel of Matthew. We're studying the Gospel of Matthew together. So what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through these five places in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to go back to some stuff we've looked at before. We're going to look at some stuff we won't get to until later. But we're going to look at five things we learn through the messianic secret, this, this concept of times when Jesus said, don't tell people about me. Today, we're going to look at five things we learned through the Messianic secret. The, the first time we see it is in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Let me read this with you. Matthew chapter 8 is the story we read about a man who had leprosy. It says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Do you know what a big deal that was? Like leprosy was literally a death sentence for this guy in every way, not just physically, but emotionally, relationally, spiritually. Jesus has changed his whole life. And it says immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Verse four, then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Does that make any sense? (laughs) that he would heal this guy, give him life, and then say to the guy, hey, don't tell anybody. Don't share this with anybody, except, and he gives him just one example. And here's what I want you to see from this first example of the Messianic secret. Number one, sometimes what Jesus does will not make sense to us. Sometimes what Jesus does will not make sense to us. Anybody ever been there? It's interesting, when you, when you look at this story, Mark tells us a little bit more about this leper than what Matthew does. Let's look at what Mark says at the end of this story. Mark chapter 1, verse 44, Jesus says, See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. And instead, the leper went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So so you understand, did the leper keep the secret? Yes or no? (laughs) No, he sure didn't. And I read you that passage because there are some scholars that say the whole reason that Jesus told people, don't tell anyone about me, was crowd control. Because he like, knew he couldn't handle it if everybody came out for the show. And, and that Jesus was like, look, I'd love for you to tell more people, but we don't have the arena booked yet. So if you'll just keep this on the down low, we got to do some more things. we got to figure out security. we got to get a good vendor for the kosher hot dogs. But once we do all that, then, 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 you can start telling people. Now, there may have been an aspect to that in the timing of things. But the reality is, to say that the reason Jesus said don't tell anybody was just because he was trying to have crowd control, you're, you're going to see this when we get to Matthew 12. There's so much more to it than that. The idea of the messianic secret is this, that Jesus did not want people talking about him because he was trying to avoid an understanding, a misunderstanding, actually, from the Jewish people of who he really came to be. They thought he was going to be a conquering king. They thought he was going to come and destroy Rome when actually the work he came to do could only be understood in the, in the light, in the perspective of understanding what happened on the cross. And if you struggle sometimes to make sense out of the things that Jesus is doing, know that you're in good company. Because this was true even about his disciples. Look at this, Mark chapter 9, verse 32. It says, but they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him. You ever been in that place? Or you're like, Lord, I, I don't know what's going on, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do about it. And all of this kind of flies in the face of who we are as good, independent, individualistic, American, democratic people. Like we would say, get the word out there. Tell people what's going on. Let people know what's happening. And you want to you wanna share things. The, the thing is that Jesus came and did it in a different way than we would do it. He wasn't necessarily out for self-promotion in those moments. And we have this idea, and and in many ways it's not a bad idea, that there are times when secrets should not be kept. We want there to be a freedom of information. We want our media to get the facts. We want to know what's going on behind the scenes. And that's good in some places. But it's good for us to know that you, you can't force God to tell you everything you want to know. Anybody ever found that to be true? 
And I'm going to guess if you're a parent, you've been guilty of this. Because there are times when you don't tell your kids what's going to happen because you know you don't want to pay the price for that information. Right? If you're going to take a preschooler to the park, you don't tell them we're going to the park four hours before you go to the park. Because if you do, you will be miserable for the next four hours. True? Because what you're doing doesn't always make common sense. Our, our grandson's in town for a few days, and so yesterday we, we were, went walking to the park down the street from our house. And as we got there, we got close, we realized that the, the, the grounds had been treated like for weeds and stuff. And we were like, probably not a good time to go to this park. So we walked right past it, which to him did not make any sense. Because that's the park he has in mind. That's what he wants to do. He did not realize that we were going to keep walking to a park that's a little further away that's actually a much more fun park. It wasn't that much further in the big scheme of things, but his grandfather's lazy. So I first wanted to go to the easy one, and he thought that's where we would go. But he didn't understand that we needed to go somewhere else, actually for his protection. He didn't understand that we needed to go somewhere else and that it would be better It just didn't make sense to him the things we were doing. And this is true so many times in the things that God does, that there are things that we just go, I do not understand this. This does not make sense to me. Here's what I want you to remember, that God's plan is perfect. True? Like even if in this moment it doesn't make sense, God's plan is perfect. And I think you'll see that God's timing is perfect. Often it's not my timing. Anybody else? (laughs) Too soon, God. Too late, God. (laughs) But God's timing is perfect. And God's purpose is perfect. Something powerful about that. And every time you see these passages, because if if you're gonna spend any time in the Gospels reading God's word, you're gonna see these moments where Jesus says, hey, don't tell anybody, don't say anything. And here's what I hope you will see, that every time you see this, you will be reminded that Jesus loves you, that he's working everything out for your good, and that what you don't understand today, you're gonna be thankful for tomorrow. Sometimes what Jesus does does not make sense to us, which kind of if you expand that a little bit, takes us to the second thing. So, So I told you we were gonna look at five instances of this messianic secret in the Gospel of Matthew. Here's the second one, Matthew chapter nine, verse 29. Here's what we read. There were, these two, there were these two blind guys, and they come to Jesus for healing, just to give you a little backstory, and uh, that's all you need to know. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Then Jesus touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done. And their sight was restored, and Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this, which is kind of a ridiculous request, isn't it? Because you got two blind guys who have not been able to see. Now they're going to just go walking around the neighborhood. Do you think anybody's going to notice? It's like something happened to Bob and Tom. Like what's, what's going on with those two guys? Like they, they can see now. So why would Jesus say this? And here's the second thing I want you to see as we look at this idea of the, the messianic secret in the Gospels. Number two, sometimes we cannot understand what Jesus is doing. Number two. Sometimes we cannot understand what Jesus is doing. Why why do people tell you not to tell someone something? Like if someone says, hey, don't tell anybody about this. You know, oftentimes if they tell you that, it's because they want to hurt you. True? Like that's the language of abuse in so many places. Hey, nobody needs to know about this. You don't have to tell anybody about this. This, this is going to be our secret. You can't share this with anyone. And oftentimes, if someone intends to do harm, they will try to get you to hold on to that as a secret, which is a dangerous, devilish, unhealthy thing. True? Is that what Jesus is doing here? Not at all. Because when else might someone tell you not to tell someone something? Maybe it's because it's not the right time for them to know. Maybe it's a matter of getting to the right timing. Maybe it's because they're trying to protect you or to protect someone else. It might just be because they want to bless you. Have you ever been invited to a surprise birthday party? (laughs) What's the whole idea? You're invited to this party, but it's a secret. Don't tell anybody. 
because the whole idea is we're holding on to this because later, at another point, it is going to be a blessing. Now look, here's one of the things I hope you'll understand. I don't want anybody to say, well, this gives me license now to keep secrets from my parents or from my spouse. Because that not, is not at all what I'm saying. Because I can just see somebody saying, you know, keeping a secret. And, and mom and dad say, well, why did you not tell us? And you said, well, Pastor Chad said that Jesus kept secrets. And I want to be like Jesus. Right? That is not what Pastor Chad is saying. But there are times when Jesus does things that you and I in the moment cannot understand. And I think there's some reasons why, right? So we just read the story about the two blind guys, right? Jesus heals them. Look at the very next verse, Matthew chapter nine, the next story. While they were going out, a man who was demon possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke and the crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Do you see what's going on there? People can't understand what's going on with Jesus here. This whole thing about the Pharisees saying it's a demon, we'll actually get to that next week when we get back to talking about the Pharisees. But this whole idea, people cannot understand the work that Jesus was doing. And here's what is is dangerous for them and is dangerous for us. That when Jesus is at work, if we think we've got it all figured out, we will miss it. See, sometimes we miss Jesus for who he is. It's exactly what you see happen in this passage. The Pharisees have it in their mind that what he's doing is actually of the devil, and so they miss Jesus for being the son of God. And those that were warriors, the zealots in that society, they just thought Jesus was just another rebel. And a lot of people who had been looking for someone to come and save them, saw Jesus and what he was doing, and to them, he was just another disappointment. Because in their minds, they thought they had him figured out. In their minds, they thought they knew who he was, and as a result, they failed to see him for who he truly was, and they missed out. Sometimes we do the same thing because of our hurt, because of our pain, because of our own ideas, because of what we think is our own intelligence. We think we have Jesus figured out, and we miss Jesus for who he really is. And sometimes we make Jesus into who he is not. Sometimes we, in our own minds, craft who we think Jesus should be. This was really the whole danger that was happening in Israel during that time. People had all these speculations about what the Messiah would be like, and then they laid them over top of who Jesus was. They they thought he would be a political conqueror. They thought he would be a military hero in some way or another. Many of them thought Jesus should come and be like royalty, and they kept saying, he will be our king. And they missed that he came to be the king of kings. And they thought he will come and he'll be a military leader. And they didn't realize that the battles he came to fight were actually spiritual They thought he would be a political leader and they thought that he would do something differently but Jesus actually came to set up his camp in our hearts and not a headquarters. And in a world that is so focused on party and platform and politicians, we need to know that Jesus came to be different. And that's tricky for us sometimes because sometimes it's hard for our hearts to understand the work that Jesus is doing in our lives. Look, look at this, Mark chapter six, verse 51. This is after Jesus has done the miracle of multiplying the fish and the bread. It says, then he climbed in the boat with the disciples and the wind died down and they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. Why does it say that the disciples could not understand what Jesus was doing? Because their hearts were hardened. Sometimes our hearts are hardened to the work that God's doing. Some of you are like, Chad, how dare you say I have a hard heart? Well, maybe you you don't have a hard heart. It just might not be very soft. (laughs) And in some area of your life, you you might not be open to seeing the things that that Jesus is actually doing. You you ever been in a place where you thought you had it all figured out? You thought you knew how life was going to go? And life throws you a curveball. God allows things to go in a different way. And those are difficult moments. And we go, God, I I didn't think it was gonna be this way. And it requires humility and it requires grace and it requires vulnerability. And we usually have a design and and we wanna get things done as quick and we wanna do it in our ways. Anybody else thank the Lord for microwaves? (laughs) 
But that's not how you and I grow so many times. Shortcuts are often not the best way. Sometimes it takes time for God to do the work that he needs to do in our lives, which means there may be a season of time where we're frustrated or where we're confused, but our hearts need time to catch up to what God wants to do in us. If, if you, in your work or your hobbies, do anything that's kind of in the creative arena, you, you might understand this, but um, this sermon is kind of an example of the process of how God does that sometimes. Some weeks when I put together a sermon, it's just easy, right? It just kind of happens and comes together. Pastor, you know this. And sometimes they're this one, <laughs> like where they just, they just take a long time. Like, and I've known we've been in Matthew chapter 12, and I knew kind of the passage that I wanted to cover, and I knew the things that I felt like we were going to do, but I probably put together five different outlines, at least five different outlines for this sermon before the one that you're hearing today. And some of you are like, oh, poor you, you only work Sundays. I know, I know, I know, I know. (laughs) But it was a lot. Right, And the, the part is, all throughout this week, I'm like, oh, I think this is what I'm going to preach. And then just inside, I'd be like, no, that's not it. Ah, I'd put some more time in, and I'd study some more, and i put together another, oh, maybe we'll handle it this way. And it's like, oh, no, that's not it. I was like, ah, oh, this is it. And honestly, it's a frustrating thing, not because I don't enjoy the process, but I got other things I need to do. And then yesterday, yesterday morning, right? I told you we were walking to the park and just kind of walking along with my family, all this kind of thing. And all of a sudden, I felt like the Lord just dropped this idea into my mind of what this message should be today. And I just kind of said to the Lord, well, Lord, that doesn't fit. (laughs) Like, that's not not how we were going to look at this passage. God, I sent you a schedule. You know what we're going to do. (laughs) You know how we're going to handle this. And I think, why, why did the Lord not just give me that on Tuesday? I can tell you why. I wouldn't have been open to it on Tuesday. I wouldn't have been listening. I would have dismissed it. It wasn't until my, my mind, my heart, went through a series of from frustration. Frust- have you ever had a frustration? <laughs> I was at the beach once and saw a little frustration that just went. Um, science nerds, that's a, that's a point right there. Um, I have these frustrations, disappointments. You're like, why does this keep going this way? And sometimes it's because my heart needs to get to a point where Jesus can do what he needs to do. Does that make sense? And there's something that has to happen through this process of what Jesus is doing because what he's doing at the outset does not make sense and they do not understand it. Can I show you why? Here's the the third place, right? We're looking at five different places. Here's the third place. This is actually the one where where we are in our study. Matthew chapter 12, verse 16. Remember, they, they were gonna kill Jesus, but then he heals all these people and he warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, and then you get next the, one of the longest quotes in Matthew from the Old Testament. And Matthew quotes the Old Testament a lot. And can I tell you something? Isaiah's prophecy has nothing to do with crowd control. <laughs> this is why I think there's something more to this messianic secret. Here's the third thing I want you to see. Number three, something about Jesus is different. It's different than who you think he is. It's different from how you think things should go. He often does things that are different from from your wisdom. The Jewish disciples were looking for a conquering king. They were looking for a military leader. They were looking for something they could not understand. And Jesus faced this everywhere he went. There's a story in John chapter six after Jesus does this great miracle where all the people come to him and the reason they flock to him is because they want to make him their king. They're like, come on, we're going to take you. We're going to make you the king. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he has to disappear and run away because he's like, you want to make me the kind of king I don't want to be. You want to make me a short-term conqueror. I came to be an eternal savior. And if I do what you want me to do, if I'm who you want me to be, you're going to miss out in life. And how many times do we come to Jesus because we want him to do a short-term fix And we miss out on the things he wants to do that actually might save our lives. And we have to be willing to say, Jesus, I'll let you be different in my life. Let me read this for you. It's from Matthew chapter 12. This is the prophecy in Isaiah, verse 17. The reason Jesus said not to tell anyone, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here's my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. 
A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. We, we could spend the rest of the day talking about that passage of scripture and how it connects to the Bible, everything from Genesis through Revelation. I just wanna show you four things real quick. What it shows us here is that Jesus is the suffering servant. That's a theme throughout the book of Isaiah. He's a suffering servant, but that means he's, he's not the king you think he should be. And Jesus is the spiritual savior. He's not a military one. In many ways, he's, he's not a physical one. And Jesus is a different leader. He's not like the Pharisees. He, he's not like the politicians. Who Jesus is, is Jesus is the hope of the world. That's what he came to do. Look, look at that passage of scripture, Matthew chapter 12, verse 21. And his name will be the hope of all the world. The problem was people wanted to make Jesus in their own image. They wanted him to be the savior that they needed. And so he had to say, no, I gotta, I gotta hold out for a little while. I, I, gotta, I gotta keep this messianic secret for a little while until your hearts are ready to receive what I really want to do, what I really wanna show you, so you can see what I really wanna be. And we do the same things. We love Jesus, but oftentimes we make him in our own image. We make him fit our mold, and we forget that he's different than, than anything we can imagine him to be. It was honestly a really tense time in my life, a lot of pressure, a lot of unknown. It was the end of my year in kindergarten. <laughs> and when we were out on the playground, every so often the first graders would come over, and they would say, boy, you better pray because you don't know which teacher you're gonna get next year. You just better hope in first grade you don't get Mrs. Lockhart. She's mean. She hates children. She's really gonna hate you. You do not want Mrs. Lockhart. And I remember hearing this, right? From, from I mean, and these are, these are experienced first graders. They know what they're talking about. And I remember spending the better part of the summer trying not to think about school, but every time I would, I'd be like, oh, man, I hope I don't get Mrs. Lockhart. Oh, I wonder what teacher I'm going to get. I, I don't want to get Mrs. Lockhart. And I remember going into that first day of first grade. you remember who I got? <laughs> Mrs. Lockhart. And you know what? She wasn't mean. She just knew how to run a classroom. <laughs> she didn't hate kids. She actually loved us. And I look back and I still have some memories of ways in which that teacher more years ago than any of your business invested in my life. She wasn't a horrible teacher. She was actually exactly the teacher that I needed. Anybody ever have an experience like that? Day one of, of the school year, you go, oh, I hope not. And by the end, you're like, man, I'm thankful. And you look back and you see that. And they had a picture of the savior they thought they needed. And it certainly wasn't the one that they got. But the one they thought they needed would have only been a short-term fix. What they needed was someone who would fix them for eternity. Does that make sense? So this is, this is something we've got to see, that sometimes when there's things that we don't understand, Jesus is at work in the midst of the things that don't make sense because he does things differently than the way that we would do things. And sometimes the reason we don't understand in the moment is so we don't misunderstand it or so we don't miss what he's doing. Oh, it's so we don't give up. How many of you have gone through things in your life that if you knew what it was gonna mean at the beginning, you would not have done it? <laughs> right, you look back and you go, if I knew at the beginning how much work that was gonna be, how much time that was gonna take, how much pain that was gonna bring, I don't know that I'd have done it. But at the end, you see it and you understand it, which, which takes us to the fourth one that I want you to see. This is the fourth time in Matthew that Jesus kind of uses what we call the messianic secret, not the messy secret. Some of you are gonna go, to lunch today, and you're gonna, Pastor talked about how to be messy. Messianic. Jesus is the Messiah. And this is at this time when Jesus is with his disciples, and he asks them this. But what about you, he asked. Who, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Was that a pretty key moment in the history of the church? You better believe it. Jesus says, who do you think I am? And God literally reveals to Peter, you're the Messiah. Jesus goes, bingo. It's in the Greek. Bingo. He says, Peter, I, Simon, I'm going to give you a new name because you're the rock. Like, like, this is it. This is the whole thing. You've understood what's going on. Verse 20 of Matthew chapter 16. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Are you kidding me? The light comes on and Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Don't share it. Don't give it to him yet. And then watch what he says in the very next verse. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus says, you got it. You're you're getting it. Now don't tell anybody here's why. Here's the fourth thing I want you to see. Some things only make sense through suffering. Some things that we go through in life will only make sense through suffering. Later, not long after this, when the disciples are with Jesus at the triumphal entry, if you've read that part of the story, Jesus is, is coming in on a donkey and the people come out, they wave the palm branches, they yell, Hosanna. Do you know what I'm talking about? It says this, John 12, 16, At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Sometimes it's only through suffering that we can get to the point where we actually see what Jesus is doing. Have you ever been there? Like you go through something and at the end you go, don't get me wrong, I would never sign up for that again. (laughs) Like I don't ever want to go through that. But on this side of it, I'm so glad I did. Because through that health crisis, through that loss, I know Jesus better. I see what he was doing. I see his work. Go ahead and look at scripture and and, and walk it through. And what you'll see is this, that there is no salvation without suffering. All throughout scripture, there is always a sacrifice. When God does his work, there is always a sacrifice that somewhere is paid. And it's often through our suffering that God does this work. I don't want to minimize this for anyone because some of you are going through something right now. Some of you raised your hands and this is where you're at, where you're going, God, I do not understand. Like for me personally, I look back and I, know, and, I, and I look at when my dad passed away way too young. I look at people I've loved that I've lost. I look at relationships that I thought were solid and then they fell apart. I look at things that, that I walk through. I look at health issues. I look at personal issues. I look at all these things. You can do the same thing. And you can be going through those things and realize that sometimes it's only through those things that our hearts can come to a point to see what God really wants to do and actually bring us to a point where he can actually work in our lives. Does that make sense? If you're going through something like that right now, maybe it started yesterday. Maybe it started decades ago. Please don't give up and don't check out. Because some of these things I think we'll only understand. We'll see this in just a moment. Some of these things we'll only understand on the other side of life. That sometimes what God has to work out does not make sense. We do not understand it. It's different than how we do it. And sometimes it only happens through suffering the things that he works out in our lives for our good. Which takes us then to the last one that I want to show you. Matthew chapter 17 Verse 9, Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. This is, this is the one where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. They go up on a mountain, and Moses and Elijah appear to them. And, and we use the language that Jesus was transfigured. Like he shows up. Glow is not a word that, that works, right? He was radiant. He shows up in all his glory. Verse 9 of Matthew chapter 17 says, As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Are you kidding me? 
These guys have just seen the craziest thing they're ever going to see in their earthly lives. <laughs> right? This is the coolest thing they've ever seen. And Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Keep this to yourself. Are any of you bad at keeping secrets? I'm terrible, especially when it's a good thing. Like there was something just ooh, in me this week, and I just I had to tell Ron, and she just looks at me and goes, why are you telling me that now? Right? Like, because I can't keep it inside until later. And Jesus says to these guys, you know the coolest thing you've ever seen? Don't tell anyone about it until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Look, I want you to get this. Number five, some things only make sense through resurrection. There are some things that you are walking through. There are some things that you are experiencing. There are some things that are happening that will only make sense through resurrection. Same story, just the way Mark tells about the transfiguration is this. Mark chapter 9, verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. They didn't even know what he was talking about. <laughs> Jesus, we, we don't understand. This secret you're keeping, we, we don't get it. But they'll get it later. They'll understand it later. Because sometimes what God is doing right now, the struggle, the questions, the uncertainty, will only make sense later when things have been resurrected. How many of you ever saw a, a movie in this building? Anybody, anybody? I know we've got people that, that are new to the church sometimes or uh, are new to the area. Every so often somebody will be like, oh, that was a movie theater, right? Because they moved to Toledo. And, and um, so we, we bought the building back in 2010. And in June of 2010, really felt like the Lord put in our hearts to, to leave a perfectly good building <laughs> that was paid for and take a step of faith that was actually kind of crazy looking back on it. But we knew the Lord was, was leading in this direction. So that started in June of 2010, kind of June, July, August, kind of went through this process and got to the point where we had, we had signed some deals and we were doing the inspections, we were doing all this kind of stuff that were kind of through the process. And about October, November, the, the, the real estate guy in Texas who was representing the movie theater corporation called up and said, hey, just so you know, um, we've got a better deal. And the way this is working out, we're going we're gonna to take it. And it was more money. And I did enough research to know it was legit. And basically all that time, all that prayer, all that energy, and we were like, this, this deal's dead. Lord, we, we thought you were in this. And all along the way, we felt like we'd had some divine revelations, if you will, of, of how confirmations of how God was leading us. And I can remember, was on the phone with this guy and our attorney we just kind of said, is, is, is there not anything we can do? And they're like, well, you could give us more money. And we as, as leadership, our board, it kind of felt like, no, this is where God told us to stay. This is what we're going to do. And we were like, well, we're, we're not going to do that. We're not going to get in the middle of that. And he's like, well, then I guess the, literally the language was, I guess the deal is dead. And then the real estate guy said, except let me do this. Let me get you on the phone with the president of the company. He's the one that makes the decision, so we'll have that conversation. And I can remember sitting in my office on Glendale, and our attorney's on the, on the line, and we've got this real estate guy, we've got the president of the company, and we're having this conversation, and he starts saying, will, will, will you give us more money? And we're like, no, we're not going to do that. And we knew that this other deal was legit, and we just weren't going to get in the middle of that. And we were just like, no, we're not going to give you more money. Well, what about this? What about this? There's this, 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 that. And literally, the guy was like, well, I just, I just think the... And he got quiet. And then he goes, ah, oh, well, we've gone this far with you guys, so we might as well just let it play out. Let's just see where this thing goes, and we're going to stick with you for now. And we hung up the phone, and I immediately called our attorney. And he picks up his phone, and his opening words to me were, and he's, he's an amazing dude, his opening words to me were, well, Chad, I think we got our resurrection. <laughs> and out of that resurrection was a confirmation that God can take the things that are dead, and he can bring them to life again. And you see that there was something he was working even through those times. Now, look, that's something I look back on personally that we look back in the history of our church. But some of you are going through something right now that does not make sense and you do not understand. And you're like, Jesus, this is different than what I thought it would be. And it feels like suffering. And I'm telling you, at some point, there's a resurrection. 
And it might be in this life or it might be in the life to come, but you can trust that someday Jesus is gonna open your eyes. There's this, there's this passage in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus, after his resurrection, is walking with some disciples on the road to Emmaus, and it says this, Luke 24, 45, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Someday that's going to happen for you. Like the thing you can't understand, the thing that doesn't make sense, the things you can't get a hold of, someday he is gonna open your minds to understand and see what he is doing because someday he is the one who brings resurrection, amen? Let me read you one more scripture. First Peter chapter one, verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Leave, leave that scripture up on the screens for just a moment so you can see it because I think we have this tendency to read through certain parts of the New Testament and actually forget who wrote them. Do you know who wrote that? The apostle Peter, the fisherman, who left everything to follow Jesus. He followed him and at one point when Peter's the one that says you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus literally says you got it and you know one of the next things that Peter says to Jesus if you read that passage is Peter says Jesus I would die for you and Jesus says no, I don't think so <laughs> and if you know the story Peter ends up denying Jesus, what a roller coaster right? I'll leave everything for you, I'll die for you, I don't even know you <laughs> and then there's this story after the resurrection when things didn't make sense, when he couldn't understand it, when it wasn't the way he thought it was gonna go, when he was suffering as bad as he ever had, that Jesus comes to him, and you read it at the end of the Gospel of John, and Jesus restores Peter, not just to ministry, but to life. So now this whole thing makes a whole different sense in my mind to know that Peter's not just writing some nice words. When he says the resurrection makes a difference, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter did not know that when he denied Jesus. Peter did not know that when things weren't going his way. Peter did not know that when Jesus was on the cross. He just knew, I don't understand what's going on. And Jesus said, I do, but hang on. And don't let go. Can you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? And we're, we're gonna sing a song in just a few moments that, that we've sang for generations. And I know that this message wasn't for everybody, but I'm sure it was for somebody. And you're going through something that you look at and you say, I just don't understand. Don't forget that what you don't understand today does not mean that Jesus is not working something out for his glory and your benefit tomorrow. So when it doesn't make sense, when it's different than what you thought, even if it seems like you're suffering today, know that he promises a resurrection. He promises that he's there. He works all things out for our good. Lord, I pray for my friends today who feel like they're in the midst of something they do not understand. In this moment, as we sing this song, God, would you let it be a prayer of trust. Let it be a prayer of commitment. Let it be a prayer of hope that our confidence is in you. In Jesus' name, amen. All to Jesus I surrender All to him I freely give I will
stand with us and sing this one more time? Send your hands to the Lord in this room, auditorium two, watch it on a screen somewhere. Just, just take a moment, an act of surrender. Jesus, we affirm that sometimes there are things in life that don't make sense and that we cannot understand. That doesn't mean you're not at work. And so, Lord, we humbly acknowledge that sometimes you do things different than us. And so we surrender and we trust you. Lord, I pray for my friends that are suffering in some way today. It may be physically in their body. It may be in their minds. It may be in their spirits. God, it may be um, circumstances that they're going through. You, You know exactly what it is. And so, Lord, I pray in this season when things don't make sense for them, would you pour out your grace? Would you let them know your love? Lord, even before the end of this week, would you just find ways to to so clearly show them that you're with them? And Jesus, would you remind us that there is a resurrection? Some things that will make sense to us in this life and maybe some things that we won't won't understand until we're with you. But we trust you. We surrender all to you. And we know that even in the midst of the things we do not understand, they feel like secrets to us. But they're a beautiful part of the plan that we'll one day understand that you have for our lives. And so, Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. Lord, would you help us to go from here today with your special favor and with your wonderful peace? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.